Welcome back, everyone, to The Charismatic Voice. I am joined today by Simona Simons. And I believe I just said your name correctly. Thank you for joining us. And how exactly should one say your name? Thank you for having me, first off. Um, the Dutch way to pronounce my name would be, would be Simona Simons. But I've been oh. called many different variations of that. And I reply to all of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> But you did really good. That's so funny. So I actually did a combination of Dutch and American then. By saying Simons, it was American, and Simona would have been the Dutch way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And but that, that's fine. I, I, I know all different variations, so I'm, not, I'm cool with any. <laughs> <laughs> and Simone is very common for somebody in America to call you. And you also had um, Simony, was that? Simony is what uh, I think somebody in China once called me that, and the band thought it was so funny, so they just called me Simony all the time. So, yeah, there <laughs> it you go. It does have a nice mm. ring to it. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of nicknames that people have given me through the years, so it's. Uh, I think you can do a lot with Simone, and also my last name. It's so similar that even if I have to do like online application forms, I just fill in Simone, Simone twice because it's like so automatic. I even did that when I was eight or so and I had some kind of ceremony at school. I filled in my name wrong. Like how, (laughs) but it happens. It's a, it's a good artist name. It rolls off the tongue very nicely. Yeah, and it was not, it's not a stage name. That's actually what's on my birth certificate uh, with two baptism names in the middle. And I had to use that for my Facebook because my name was taken already. So I have like this long name for my Facebook page and then official at the end. <laughs> so, right. Now, what is, what's the nickname that you have? Um, Smoon? You, since we're talking about nicknames, did you have Smoon style? I think you have a, a blog of mm-hmm. lifestyle things. Where does, Smoon come from? <laughs> um, that is also because my name was taken for an email address, so I had oh. to leave in, I had to leave out the I, and even that didn't work. And then it was um, Simone S that did, Simone S that didn't work. And then for some reason, I went to um, Smoontje, I guess. That's like a small, like my mother calls me Simonche, which is like the, mm-hmm. the little nickname. I thought I'd pick that and I leave out the I and then I add the S from Simons. And then when I made my blog, when I created the blog, I thought, oh, okay, um, Roy Khan actually started calling me Simon, Simonche because of my email address, oh. um, which I don't have anymore. <laughs> and then he... Uh, he was like, Simone, and I'm like, ah, oh, Simone style is actually cool. Simone style. So if you say it mm-hmm. quickly, Simone style, it's like Simone style. So you pronounce it as how you would say my name, Simone. So not Smoon, uh-huh. as in the moon, but Simone style. Simone. So, Simone style, yeah. So my style, everything that I like and do. And that's the blog, which is already 12 years old this <laughs> September. It's crazy. That's really impressive. Wow. 12 years old. Oh, man. So I'm really excited to talk with you about uh, becoming a mom and how that affects singing Mm -hmm. and your lifestyle. But that just made me realize if the blog is 12 years old, you were already doing that when you had your son. Yes. Yes, I I did. Yeah. I I was... I started a couple years before and then uh, I was very active when I was still pregnant and then I had had my son and then um, I was not so active anymore. And nowadays I work a lot besides Epica as also a photographer. So Mm -hmm. I don't have the time anymore to do everything. Um, I would need more hours in a day. I bet you can probably agree on that now that you have a baby boy as well. Yep, (laughs) fully agree. Not enough hours. Yes, (laughs) but it's wonderful. It is. It's such a joy to be to be a mom and to be a musician and to have it all. Basically, I have to say, we picked some of the best things in life to go after. Yes. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, what do you like more, tea or coffee? Oh, now I can totally connect this with being a mom. Before I had my son, I was a tea person. And I didn't drink a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and um, 
Then I had my son and then I was like, oh, I always loved the smell of coffee, but now I actually drink coffee in the morning until midday. Mm -hmm. But in winter, I just, I love tea, but I always start mm -hmm. my day with the coffee. Mm -hmm. And then I, in the winter, I drink tea, more hot tea more than uh, summertime. I actually, I made myself a iced tea. Ooh, what kind of iced tea is it? It is peach uh, passion fruit. Ooh. It's really yummy. And I love this because uh, these are just like normal tea bags and you can oh, make iced tea just with cold water. You don't need to, uh, I don't know, steep it and put it in the fridge and everything. It's like yeah. ready to go. And, and my son and husband love this too. Um, and it's nice and refreshing. Yeah, that's really easy. I like that. So um, my question, to answer your question is, I, I like both actually. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long uh, answer to a short question. Sorry. Hmm. <laughs> No need to apologize. We're all about the, the conversation here. Like that's yes. more important, I think, than the answers. <laughs> um, the, I'll take a quick sip. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, I'd read somewhere that you also have a tea time that happens. Is this mm -hmm. related to Patreon? Is that correct? It's one of my monthly things that I kind of developed or I thought I wanted to do like a Q&A, get to know me better. Um, to be in closer touch with uh, all the patrons, to have a little bit more an intimate community feeling, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, okay, then I'll just drink my favorite tea <laughs> and have a, like a little snack with it. And every every month, I drink a different tea or out of a different mug and have like my favorite uh, sweet treat of the moment. And then it started to be like tea time with Simone, and yeah. <laughs> It's it's a it's a lot of fun, but I always have to edit out me slurping my tea or like <laughs> munch, munching on on a cookie because I think uh, not everybody wants to hear that. There are people that love those sounds, and there are people that hate those sounds. And I actually don't like to hear it about myself. But I recently posted a TikTok of me eating like crunchy candy paper because I was having fun with my son. I thought this is perfect for TikTok. That's really fun. I, I like crunch. Yeah. I like crunchy sounds, but I don't like them. The, oh, in smacking. Germany we say smacking, smacking. that I don't like. <laughs> Schmatzing, yeah, that, that I, I don't like. I find that very uh, appalling. But the crackling of like chips and anything crunchy, that that is my, my thing. Yeah. Uh, if you like <laughs> the crackling of chips, I swear to you, the sound of um, kale chips in particular, okay. when you've um, usually put them under a broiler or like you know, put them in the oven essentially – Mm -hmm. It gets so crunchy. It sounds like a chip commercial. And, Ooh. Right? <laughs> and it's healthier, right? Yes. So you don't have such a bad conscience eating a whole bag. Uh, uh -huh. I, I can probably get those when I go to America later this year. We'll have a tour probably. coming up. So I'm I'm looking forward to have lots of American snacks. And I'll remember the kale chips when I eat them. Uh, I can make a TikTok just for you if you want. Like. <laughs> you <laughs> have to let me know when that's coming out. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's <what> I will. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, um, as far as the sweet things, I also had a, a later note, but I want to ask now: um, Is it usually chocolate? My snacks, my sweet yeah. treats. Well, I'm a typical Dutchie, so I love licorice as well. <gasps> that's a very typical Dutch thing to eat, <laughs> and not many like it. But my son, who is half Dutch, Hungarian, German but born in Germany, so he gets all the German food mm -hmm. and traditions. But I always make fun, like, you're half Dutch, you're only quarter German, because my husband is half Hungarian. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my son loves licorice as well, but all the kids that come to play here, they spit it out. It's like, I know in, in America it is very uh, uh, sweet. It's not the really strong, mm -hmm. dark, uh, like the black licorice with uh, licorice root. I love that. But so far for my tea times, it's basically cookies because that goes well with um, uh, with tea. Or <laughs> yeah, like shortbread. I, I, I cheated. I also, I also did tea time with an espresso ones because I really needed it. But oh. <laughs> but cookies and chocolates, I love too. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a sweet uh, person. Like, I love sweets. Yes. How about you? <laughs> oh, um, definitely. Chocolate is a really big thing. Nutella is a huge mm -hmm. thing for me. There were these chocolates that my husband bought me um, early on in pregnancy when my taste buds were changing. They were an exotic chocolate um, like sample selection. 
Ooh, and sounds nice. <laughs> right? I those ones they were crazy. There was one that had matcha in it. You know, there, there were a couple different kinds with spices because that's a thing. There's mm-hmm, one with like a mm-hmm. violet flower. And but when they would talk about the ingredients of them, they'd say, "Oh, this is from salt in the Himalayas," or you know, it would have very specific sourcing of some of the ingredients of it. And that was a ton of fun to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, also with tea <laughs> but so did you have point, different cr- cravings mm-hmm. like like the pickles and and weird weird things besides chocolate <laughs> yeah I chocolate was always big for me so that was always going to be great but um I, I'd say like the aversions actually hit me stronger than the cravings and I was I had a very strong aversion to pickles so oh, okay um I didn't eat pickles and I loved pickles before <laughs> so I didn't eat them for okay. Nine months, and then uh, after I gave birth, I ate pickles again, and they were delicious once again. It's funny, <laughs> funny how it works. Right? I I couldn't stand the smell of my husband cooking like pasta sauce, and make me want to throw up tomato Whoa. sauce. Like really, uh, I I had to like go up to the to the bedroom, but other than that, I just had my and I had I wanted to have greasy food, and they say when you have when you're getting a boy. I was eating like hamburgers and and fries, and I normally never eat that stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm also vegetarian now, but I I loved the greasy stuff. I, I even fries. I'm not a big fry person, mm-hmm. and I couldn't get enough of them. Um, but I gained like 20 kilos. Also, <laughs> I was like, uh, I had a four four kilo baby also inside me. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I was eating four or two, I guess, and they say you shouldn't, but I thought, you know, what the hell, I'll I'll get it off again. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to worry about being on the diet while being pregnant. Exactly. And I didn't only eat hamburgers. I also ate healthy stuff. So. Did you like potatoes a lot? If you liked fries. No, and, and Dutchies are potato people, but I'm not a big potato fan. I love sweet <laughs> potato though, but mm. nor my my husband. We both prefer more like asian food or italian we are more like noodles and rice kind of uh, i had too many potatoes as a child i guess my parents <laughs> ruined it <laughs> oh, oh well um i was on the fries kick with you too and i also didn't really like fries before so very interesting i agree maybe maybe the the greasier things mean you're gonna have a way yeah, when when you're pregnant with a girl, I heard lots of women say that they they were craving fruit and fresh yeah. fruit and stuff. But and the funny thing is, during my pregnancy, I was eating a lot of um, mint chocolate chip ice cream, <laughs> and my son loves that too. And my son actually also loves Earl Grey, so he loves <gasps> a couple of really peculiar things. I think that not a lot of kids like because I ate it, uh, drank it during pregnancy, and it just proves that he's he's Dutch. So, <laughs> <laughs> and definitely yours. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. Yeah, mama's boy. <laughs> Aww, that, that makes sense. Well, okay. So you are originally from the Netherlands, right? Yes. Are correct. you correct? Are you still based there? Are, you guys are in Germany now, right? Yes, my husband is uh, German and lives in Germany. So I decided because I have to travel anyway for my job. It doesn't matter. I actually live closer, like closer to an airport now than when I lived in the Netherlands. So, mm. and I have to fly a lot. Of when I have to travel by train, it adds up a little bit. But that was, um, I was willing to take that extra travel time. Yeah, it's and I feel so at home nice. here. Oh yeah, good, 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 good. It's so nice in Europe. It was just so easier to, so much easier, I think, to travel by train. Versus mm-hmm. that's true in a lot of other places it's beautiful um, yeah and how much you actually home because you travel so much with epica touring right yeah yeah i mean the two pandemic years i was home a lot which was the true. silver lining of the whole thing not being able to tour but finally being home a lot mm-hmm. and now the touring starts again we had festivals and we went to mexico and we'll, we will be going to north america Latin America and our European tour, which has been postponed many times, will finally happen next year. So, um, yeah, now with the, with in between the festivals, I'm home two, three days. I can do some office work and then I got to repack my bag and hope that 
planes or flights are not canceled or we mm. have emergency landings <laughs> with the airplane. We've had quite a ride or flight schedule last couple of um, months. So I'm always happy when I'm home for a couple of days to recharge my battery and spend time with my family. Yeah, that must be really difficult to be gone for weeks, months at a mm. time. Yeah, luckily not months at a time, but the, yeah, the longer tours, they're tricky. To get into the tour, you need to switch your mindset and go into work mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it's once you get into that mode, it's, it's fine. But by, by the end of the tour, you're like, oh, I really want to go home now. Uh, all of us have that now uh, in the band, especially mm -hmm. we have now four kids. So three of the Epica uh, band members have kids. Uh, the wow. newest addition is a uh, son from our guitarist. And he, he had a Corona baby. So he was home <laughs> all the time. And now um, we start traveling again. The max we've been away was two and a half weeks, but we have a long tour coming up. So... Yeah. We're probably going to cry on each other's shoulders. I miss my baby. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say because I, I think the North American tour is going to be pretty a pretty long one. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a long one, yeah. <laughs> that's really exciting that you're able to tour again. <laughs> yeah, that was something since I knew, since I was 17, and then suddenly the pandemic came and we were home a lot and... Even before that, before we had our last album, Omega, when we wrote and recorded it, we had a sabbatical. So I didn't tour a lot before the pandemic came. Mm -hmm. So we were actually gearing up to go again. Yes. And then it was like, oh, we got two more years of sabbatical in a way <laughs> after. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> but we... Like I said, the silver lining was being home with uh, family. But yeah. uh, on top of that, we had to do homeschooling. Well, the ones uh, that have ki had kids in school. So that was uh, trying to record an album and doing homeschooling later during the day was also kind of weird to juggle those things. I imagine. Um, I want to give a, a new mom some tips on how to juggle that recording and and baby crying because i i don't know if you heard earlier but even at the beginning of this he was crying in the background oh yeah. i love babies babies are so cute i actually had to do once a recording a guest recording for um the band angra mm -hmm. and the song is called secret garden and my son was still quite small and i recorded it in the studio of my husband and that's also where my family-in-law lives so when we were working, my son was upstairs and he could hear me Aww. and he was crying. So I had to take him, put him on the hip and I was singing, like belting out in the highest chorus with him on my hip. And he was like looking at me, <laughs> but he was quiet. So I was singing, recording the vocals while having him on my hip. But the, the recordings of Omega were a little bit tricky because uh, I had to, my husband and I both had to find a way to make it work. And he's also a teacher. So I had to do my vo vocal recordings early in the day. My son was not in school, so he could be with our son. And then I had to come back so he could teach and I could be with our son. Mm -hmm. But I am not a big fan of singing early in the morning. I, no. <laughs> It's not the best time unless you have to do really low parts. Right, yeah. And um, then, then I'd like to use the mornings to do uh, yeah, some deeper vocals if, if it needs to you know, mm -hmm. sound nice and rich in the deeper tones. But to then belt really high or sing opera really high when I actually am not fully awake yet was tricky so um i also yeah. had to record it in germany normally i go to the netherlands and that wasn't possible so we set up the whole recording system via zoom as well 
So we had a recording engineer recording my voice, but our producer from the Netherlands was there with me on the iPad on on Zoom, mm -hmm. so he could hear uh, the the recordings give little uh, tips or, or like say, do this or that again. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the recording, the recording engineer would send over the files to our producer and he would check it and edit it. And and that's how we worked. I had like an office job. I had to make myself a little lunch, uh, <laughs> lunch box, uh, drive myself to the studio, sing for a couple of hours and drive back home. <laughs> uh -huh. That was That was kind of a weird situation I never had. If I go to the Netherlands, I will be there for like two weeks and then I focus only on my voice and then I rest afterwards and I couldn't do that because I was home and had to do all the home stuff and uh, home schooling and all that stuff so it was very intense but yeah I am very happy with the end result nevertheless but if I hear the songs I'm like if people only knew <laughs> how challenging it was to to get it all uh, to make that but, happen yeah yeah we're we're flex we have to be flexible and you have to be pragmatic and we did we we made it so i'm happy for that you find a way yes, <laughs> yes. and i imagine that one of the the great things about being able to go somewhere else for two weeks is that you have that vocal rest time when you're yes. not recording mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if you're instead doing homeschooling mm -hmm. um that vocal rest time is disappearing. So it must have been extra taxing on your vocal cords. Yeah, I, and the fact that everybody was also stressed with the situation, it was new for the kids uh, to be in that situation. And in the back of my mind, I also knew, okay, we got to finish this record and yeah. what what is going to happen to the world. It was such a weird, uh, the beginning. Um, and of course, there was a lot of panic and we didn't mm -hmm. know much about it. So I was, I had some sleepless nights as well, which is not good for the voice either. So I strained my voice a little too much and then we had to mm. have a break for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not only for me not using my voice, but also just resting completely my whole body. Because after four, five, six hours of singing, you're like drained. You're yeah. like, like a, <laughs> right. like a, how do you say, um, cleaning cloth, like uitgevringd, like... Right. You have no energy anymore. You're just like completely yeah. empty. Yeah. Because it's so intense. You, the One of the things that I always thought uh, when performing, especially when I'm doing really, really difficult opera bowls on stage, mm -hmm. I was always shocked by how exhausted my body was the next day after a big performance. Mm -hmm. It was like my legs were tired. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think that if you're really supporting your whole voice with your body maybe not mm -hmm. legs legs probably was probably due to like a rake on the stage or something like that but <laughs> you definitely get tired down in your ribs mm -hmm. and you know um in your lower support my back. system <laughs> yes exactly my back is, is hurting especially if i wear high heels which oh. i don't do that much anymore <laughs> so my back is mostly killing me then by the end of the show and mm -hmm. um and, and my neck, if we have the first show in a while, then, you know, I if I work out, I work out all my muscles except for my head banging, like my neck muscles. So that always needs a couple of days and then I'm used to it. Ah. But, uh, but overall, I think uh, even <laughs> after the two years of not touring much, I thought my stamina was going to be really bad, but it wasn't. I guess going on hikes uh, in the forest helped a little bit. <laughs> Right. Um, tell me more about the neck muscles and the head banging, because I've I've heard different people talk about head banging and how mm -hmm. it can be relaxing in some ways if you brace your yourself on like with your hands on your legs and your windmilling. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit more to the uh, the neck initial stress and also um, how you might do that in a way that is protecting your voice? Uh, I've had this, this discussion with my parents many times because they say <laughs> it's not good what you're doing. Uh, it's not good for your brain. It's um, And then I told them, hmm. well, back in the day when I was younger, it makes me sound like a grandma, but I mean, <laughs> I, we are now already at the 20 year mark of our career. Uh -huh. um, I did crazy stuff 
and I did the windmill and I had also longer hair. So after, once you get started, it's about having your hair helping you making that motion. Yeah. But I stopped doing really heavy uh, headbanging because, I don't know, I, I guess my body just couldn't do it anymore. Like the really crazy stuff. And one of mm -hmm. our band members actually had a, herniate, a couple herniated discs in his oh, neck. So he had to stop and he had to like, what do I do on stage? I got to think of new moves. And I told him, you look good. Just stand there and look good. <laughs> yeah. but he's like making other moves to compensate for... He, he used to be like a serial headbanger. He was like all over the place. And then suddenly he had to stop. Yeah. But I... Um, the last couple of years, I used basically my whole upper body. I don't really use my neck that much. It's basically like throwing your body to the front. And, and I do mostly side-swept uh, headbanging. Or when we do synchronized headbanging, we all just basically, our upper body goes down. Uh -huh. And it's not so much out of the neck. Only that the windmill really is a neck movement. But yeah. I I went to physiotherapy many times. And she told me the technique that I used was not harming my body in any way. But you feel if it hurts. It's the same with singing. If it starts to hurt, you're doing something wrong. Yep. Um, yeah, and my head never fell off on stage, so I guess <laughs> I kind of <laughs> developed good. a good good technique. But I do it uh, with moderation now. I'm not the heavy headbanger I used to be. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, let's talk a little bit about early music influences because I want to know a little more about where you come from. Um, just doing a little reading and prep work, uh, learning even more about you than what I had known. Uh, I saw that you, you Googled started... me. <laughs> well, actually, to be really honest, I have an assistant, um, and he also does a ton of management of our YouTube channel and directs some of the operations mm -hmm. as well. Um, but he, uh, will do prep work and has this whole, it's kind of incredible, has this <laughs> entire thing, like multiple pages. Um, I'm just wow. <laughs> write, write down a bunch of extra things so that way I don't, you know, say something that's really wrong that I mix up with a different artist or something. So he gives me <laughs> that's this. all right, <laughs> <laughs> right? I know, um, but he he does this sort of deep dive and then pulls out all of these different things from your life mm -hmm. and often will give me links. And so that's how I knew about the blogging and went to that link and was looking at that and your photography as well. Anyhow, his name is Paolo. He's amazing. We love, Hi, love, Paolo. love Paolo. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so um, I'd read in this that you started with flute, not singing, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I. it's obligatory or mandatory. Um, primary school to first learn to play the flute when you are like 11 or, or really? 12 like the last last years of primary school we all have to learn how to play the flute in a basic way so reading uh -huh. uh, music sheets it's but this flute, very right? not not no, the it's, recorder. it's this one it's the recorder it's one. okay got it got it got it got yes it. okay and then and then i switched to this one uh -huh. I played the flute for the other flute in germany it's called querflute in dutch we say dwarsfluit and the other one's block flute, the straight one. Yeah, block, it's like like some people. Block. I've seen <laughs> transverse flute too. Versus, yeah, they're different. But yes, okay. We call it recorder sometimes when it's Record. this one, and then okay. just call this flute. But I know okay. that there's tons of different names for them. So you you did the you did the the recorder first. recorder first, <laughs> and then the other flute. Yeah, and then do 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 do. And yes. how long did you play? This flute, the horizontal one. <laughs> For one and a half to two years, I couldn't oh. get along with my teacher. She oh. was very strict. I, I had like, I was always nervous and I mm. didn't feel comfortable with her. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I quit because of her. Yeah, because we wow. were not a good match. So uh, I always, I enjoyed playing the flute a lot. I love the sound it makes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a beautiful instrument. I had a really beautiful flute. Uh, I got it second hand, but uh, I couldn't get myself to go to the lessons. It was like, uh, no, I quit. And then I started to get vocal lessons 
And that was in pop first, right? Yes, yes, pop, jazz music. I had uh, my first show when I was 12 at the primary school musical. I had to sing a Whitney Houston song. Oh, wow, which one? And All at Once. (laughs) Very nice. Not not a very typical uh, Whitney Houston song that mm-hmm. a lot of people know. Everybody uh, knows the Dolly Parton song. Uh, right. I will always love you. From from the Bodyguard. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I started to get singing lessons after my music teacher from primary school told me I had a good voice, but I was very shy at first. But she gave me that push in the right direction because otherwise I might not have have never have done that because mm-hmm. she. Uh, suddenly gave me a compliment that I never had gotten before. And I think when you're a younger child or pre-adolescent, you're very vulnerable yes. uh, for the opinions of, of grown-ups around you that you respect so much. So I, completely yeah, I still agree. have to send her some flowers. Oh, uh, giving me that push. <laughs> you should. <laughs> That'd be such a sweet, a sweet thing to remember. And, uh, and then you went from pop or and jazz it sounds like as well to classical singing Mm -hmm. yes and how long did you study classical singing then for I think if I remember correctly between five and six years Mm -hmm. I had vocal lessons from the same uh, teacher Mm -hmm. which I recently met up with again to uh, film uh, like a, a vlog a day in the life and oh. I was at my hometown and I thought, why not write my vocal teacher if he wants to meet up? So I saw him earlier this year again and it was really nice. And we went to my old school, where I, which is now closed, but they opened it up for me to film the episode. And uh, that was very nostalgic to yeah. walk in that building you know everything pre-epica and and being just still a very innocent young teenager dreaming about maybe becoming a singer one day and then many years later traveling around the world many times to return there and to reflect on how far I've come since then and also to see him again and then he was talk he had very other memories of of us working together than I had but I've always been with my head in the clouds so I guess I I don't register everything that's happening around me. Or maybe it is the headbanging. <laughs> <laughs> the da- and brain damage. Um, I joke about that a lot. But yeah, that was... I loved working with him. And then when I started touring with Epica, I just had irregular lessons with him mm-hmm. and worked with other uh, vocal teachers to have workshops for singing in the musical, learning techniques for belting and ah. broadening a little bit my... Um, singing style yeah actually can you talk a little bit more about that I'm really curious um especially because I I see such a combination of different styles Mm -hmm. and underneath them all just some very solid technique in your performing so um after sort of having that classical bass I think a lot of people have a, a misconception that uh if you can sing classical music you can sing anything it's true I mm-hmm. think that it's a great foundation but mm-hmm. uh if I I think if a classical musician wants to learn how to do musical theater they need to go find somebody to help them with belting mm-hmm. so uh, that that's mm-hmm. that's actually good uh, that you said um I stopped going to my classical teacher because I felt that I needed indeed to work with other people to teach me other techniques Mm -hmm. because you cannot apply the classical singing technique to to uh, to to rock music to belting and for me I felt like okay I've learned as much as I could from him and now it's time to to move on I was also gone a lot traveling a lot Mm -hmm. and then I was asked to sing in the rock musical and (laughs) I was also a teacher um she she was a force of nature and we actually worked together on the songs for the design universe album so that is oh. 12 years ago uh-huh. and i went i went through the songs with her to let her uh how do you say uh um tweak my techniques Perfect. in order for me to uh yeah improve wherever 
I she could hear and needed to improve and she taught me some some tricks as well first for that rock opera and then I loved working with her and I asked her if she could spend a couple days with me so we could work on on the songs and and after that I also did some uh, lessons with a teacher close to where I live he was hella expensive I was like oh that's (laughs) that's a hefty price tag but I'm willing to uh, to pay because I wanted to learn and it was really lovely working with him because he had worked with huge musical uh, stars and he was also familiar with classical singing but had more techniques that he Mm. could show more styles of singing that he could teach and the moment I opened my voice and I just started singing and he was like wow you have such a lovely voice and I was Again, like that little girl from primary school, like, oh, wow, he thinks I can sing. Even though I have been standing in front of a lot of people, he uh, he was a renowned vocal teacher giving me mm-hmm. a compliment. And I was like, wow, I'm, I was so humbled by that. And you forget that also because I'm very critical when it comes to p- performing my myself, I guess. And you, mm-hmm. it's your job. You do it. Yeah. And then you forget about, you know, oh, now like the two years being at home. I would sing every now and then, but I can sing really loud. And my husband and son say, stop, it's too loud. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but I'm a singer. And that's how I get my energy out. And when I'm happy, I want to sing. And uh, that's one of the things to make like a little jump that I missed also the most of not performing is having that feeling of when you're happy, you want to channel that emotion, mm-hmm. the happy emotion. And then I start singing. And I sometimes felt like I couldn't go to my fullest potential or fullest volume (laughs) which is really loud because of uh, being at home and I don't sing a lot or loud at home because all my neighbors can can hear it and I don't think they would mind but still this is not a place where I sing full full force but I I miss that because that is a huge part of me and um, yeah so Mm -hmm. I, I went to work with the other teacher and he gave me also some really useful tips and tricks. That's something where the brain says, ah, I get it. And it's not years of practicing, but it's also about getting the right tips and being able to uh, apply it right away. Yeah, and being open for those tips at that time. Mm, yeah. So I'd love to know uh, a little bit about those tips and tricks. Like, let's get into that nitty gritty. Is it things like... Um, I, I know in different periods of life, I'd have people talk about the loft in the voice or the dome, which is essentially the same thing. They're just saying mm-hmm. it in different ways. Or some people would say twang or having a forward focus. What mm-hmm. Were those tips having to do more with that sort of resonance placement or were they more based in, in the phonation, like thinking like, oh, I have like uh, maybe a little more closure here or maybe try to have uh, an onset that had less... Um, air leakage or more air leakage what kinds of tips were helpful um well starting with with classical singing it all started with the right uh, um, position of the body Mm -hmm. so feet hips wide tilt your butt tilt your hips so you have a straight back (laughs) and uh, (laughs) he was always like yeah and, and try not to have the Shoulders, everything here, right. be tight. Everything needs to be relaxed. And breathe through your belly. So don't breathe up high because then you have tension again. So I learned at a very early age to have belly breathing. Mm-hmm. Even when I when I talk, even my, when I get excited, I might go into higher uh, breathing. Um, and that's also something I can talk about giving birth <laughs> about in, the, in a minute <laughs> when I get <laughs> yes, there. we'll talk about that. <laughs> There's also great techniques for that. But um, yeah, and breathe, breathe through your nose with your mouth open to open up mm. the whole area here and to have, yeah, to have the, the, the air go up and, and resonate for classical singing. Um, what else? It's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not a teacher at all. I I'm uh, not like my husband. I'm not good at explaining things <laughs> and the anatomy of it, um, but it's programmed in me, I guess, the classical yeah. singing. It just, that's what I love also about classical singing. 
that you can create the sound with your voice and and this not distort your voice but change your voice mm -hmm. from your speaking voice when i sing uh, pop jazz then you can hear my my speaking voice my mm -hmm. voice doesn't change much there not like yeah. for example tori amos i find <laughs> it always very i'm jumping from uh, here to there but i find it very mysterious intriguing how Uh, certain singers have a singing voice and then you hear them in an interview and it's like that's not the same person I don't totally recognize different. maybe a little bit the pronunciation or like, some consonants <laughs> but they're, they're, like Gwen Stefani also has a completely different voice when she yeah. sings than when she speaks I think I'm Ozzy not... was one of the really big examples recently that really shocked me <laughs> yeah Oz but he still has the ah in his voice when he speaks a when little he bit has, Mm -hmm. When he sings, yeah, he's a he's a interesting um, character. But um, so I was with classical classical singing, um, and I love how the voice changes when you sing classical. And sometimes I am amazed myself, like wow, this is really a beautiful technique. The classical yeah. singing it still gets me the most if I listen to a classical singing. Oh, and that that kind of I guess sparks that joy in me that when I started because I had pop and jazz singing lessons and I felt like this is not not for me and mm -hmm. I, I felt like I wasn't learning techniques or anything I felt like I learned the pop singing at the later stage after I learned how to sing classical mm -hmm. and my teacher she was nice but she was also talking too much and I felt like it's not educational enough it was mm -hmm. entertaining <laughs> and then I got into the classical singing. And the fun uh, uh, fact is that my great aunt, so the aunt of my mother, is actually a singing teacher for classical music. Ah. And when my parents heard that I wanted to take classical singing lessons at the age of 16, they asked my great aunt to come by and have a listen to my voice uh, mm -hmm. and say, you know, okay she's ripe enough or how do you say it's a lot of mature you have to be mature enough uh -huh. yeah. ripe ripe like a plum <laughs> ripe. <laughs> to have uh to start singing heavy classical music yeah that's but, true uh she said i should maybe wait two years but i didn't listen i started taking classical mm -hmm. singing lessons at the age of uh 16 17 yeah i think you can take um, classical lessons early as long as you're not doing really heavy roles or repertoire mm. there is repertoire that is you know written for people that are young and youthful and exuberant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I, I love I love also when I hear small children singing opera yeah. style but you can still hear that they need to mature but I think with the mm -hmm. age of 16 it's kind of safe I mean you're still in yeah. your adolescent years but um Yeah, so I, I started getting classical singing lessons despite my aunt saying I should wait maybe. But, you know, I'm a person that does more thinking with my intuition than with mm -hmm. my head. So I went with the gut feeling and just went for it. And I had I had the right connection with my, my singing mm -hmm. teacher, which was is very important, I think. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I listen to you sing... I noticed one thing in particular that I think a lot of classical musicians learn to negotiate, and that is that you've learned how to manage your second passaggio in particular. And it's so interesting that you mentioned uh, working on this. Um, I think you probably worked on Tides of Time with that teacher you'd mentioned before, right? Um, that is also one of the songs in uh, the design. Uh, design universe. Yeah. Yes, the ballad, which yeah. is one of my favorite ballads of all time. I recently heard it for the first time and made a video on that and ah, right. <laughs> cool. So um, that will premiere right before this interview does. So people have just watched oh, it. Oh, okay. 
And <laughs> that the way you negotiate the passaggio in that is amazing. I mean, the passaggio is just like such a evil place, I feel like, in the voice where everything is kind of shifting. You're like, oh, gosh, why, why are all the notes feeling like they want to slip out of the right place? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that classical singers have to learn how to negotiate that more because they often have a thicker sound on the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious, was that something in particular that you worked on with that teacher? And I, I don't recall working on tides of time that much, except for uh, the yeah the bridge where I have to <laughs> really belt out that note. But I recall like unleashed, mm. um, which is also uh, yeah higher belting style. Which is my more my comfort zone mm-hmm. to uh, like to you know have a lot of power. Um, I had it's, it's a long time ago, but I remember in particular unleashed for me. Um, but I do I do love tides of time, and the thing is, I actually had a cold when I had to record oh. tides of time. If you listen closely, you can hear a little bit of nasal congestion. <laughs> but maybe that worked for the sound that day. Yeah, I think it's it sounds it, it doesn't sound um like oh she she has a cold. Uh, yeah. like very th- that you can really if you listen closely you can maybe recognize it here and there. But that that happens unfortunately uh, every now and then when you have vocal recordings and it's timed in the autumn winter phase, yeah, oh. you can get a uh, catch a cold or um, yeah. So but what do luckily, you do knock when on you're wood, sick? What do you do to make it better for a recording session? If I uh, don't sound too nasal, I just record. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, with more like when I get tired, then the voice starts to get uh, what I have now because I it's the end of the day. Yeah. You get tired and then you you hear it. A um, little fraying kind of like a... Uh, yeah. That happens. That, that, <laughs> yeah. The, a little fry. The, the grudge. The grudge or the ring. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. That When I'm tired, then my voice is tired. And that, that is actually more tricky. I've performed with super high fever. I've performed after having surgery. Um, but being tired to the bone then your voice is tired as well. And that's always, that is the more tricky part than having to blow your nose in between songs because mm-hmm. you're afraid you might slam on, on the audience. <laughs> but <laughs> I've, I've had very few times where I actually lost my voice and I had to get um, cortisone shots. Oh yeah. Um, the shots. The last, the last time was on my 30th birthday. We played in Berlin and we had a doctor come by and gave gave me an IV with whatever, a cocktail, and it didn't work. I had to sing everything really low. I couldn't get high at all. Oh, and yeah. I told the audience, like, today's my birthday. I don't have a voice, but I want to party, and you're just going to have to sing for me. And everybody was like, yay. <laughs> but it sounded horrible. Oh. It sounded horrible. Man, it was, was like, so rough. Mm. Yeah, and it's a frail thing, the voice, but... It, Big part of it is of lis- is listening to your body. How do you feel when you wake up? And if I I sometimes have trouble sleeping, and then I just know, okay, I gotta reserve all the energy that I have after rest during the day. So the little energy that I have, I can put in the show. Mm-hmm. When when you wake up and you're feeling uh, just low on that energy, or you haven't slept very well, is there anything that you shift in your warm up uh, to try and get it back? There is not much that I can do. I just mm-hmm. feel more that the the more I do, the the worse it will get. Ah. I just I sing in a very uh, economical way, mm-hmm. um, and I often go into lazy mode and sing a lot in the head voice because that is what is still there even if you're tired. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can I can do that pretty well, so I cheat a little. Mm-hmm. Well, that actually. Uh, that kind of brings me to another question. How do you think about your vocal registers? Uh, can you be more specific? Yeah. <laughs> well, you said head voice. and Yes, um, yes. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting to me. People from different backgrounds mm-hmm. often think about their vocal registration differently. So 
Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes you'll hear people say, register one, two, three, and just give them numbers. I actually, I kind of like that because sometimes when we're talking chest, mixed head voice, Mm -hmm. um, I know what I learned from classical music and that was very, very much ingrained in me for 20 years. And then later on, as I was working more and more with people in other genres, Mm -hmm. they wanted to call them different things. And I realized then, oh, mixed is what some people are calling head voice in classical, Mm -hmm. but a lower portion of the head voice. Some people call true head voice, some of that upper stuff. And then there's Mm -hmm. other opinions. Um, One idea that I was really impressed by was that Every note is essentially its own register because all we're talking about is different activation percentages of the thyroid retinoid muscle and your cricothyroids. Mm -hmm. And when you think about just different percentages, then you almost don't need to think about register shifts as much, even though that could be super useful for predicting where things might change quickly. So anyhow, how do you think about those big shifting points in your voice? Well, when we write songs with Epica, we keep in mind the the register of my voice where I can, uh, you know, ha- where I have the most power in my voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I recently, funny enough, I I got the question like, "What is your official vocal reach?" I'm like, "Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can I can sing." Uh, I consider myself a soprano, but mezzo soprano. I can sing really high, but not as super high, like uh, I don't know, Zauberflöte, <laughs> like Queen <laughs> like of the, the Night. Really, <laughs> they're the really uh, squeaky. I actually, my my vocal reach has expanded a lot over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, partially technique, partially also what they say with pregnancy and and your voice changing when you have so all the hormones in your body, everything yeah. becomes more limber. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> um, but then I got this question like, Oh, I don't know. So I Googled it. And then there's this half an hour video of people putting so much time and effort into picking out little parts of a song and saying, okay, this is this note. And she sings all the way up till there. Mm-hmm. But the really low ones is what I said before. I do that in the morning. Or if you have a cold, then you can go really low. And as the day progresses, your voice gets higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then I asked Joost, our producer that I worked with now the last, uh, I don't know, eight or nine years or 10 years even, like what is my my power reach? And then he gave me this whole whole uh, whole list, and he's like, yeah, if you sing too low, you can't sing low, but then you start to sound like a dude, <laughs> <laughs> and and you can sing super high, but then you start to sound like a bird, like squeak, squeak squeaking. Uh huh. Um. So I I he says between C four C five is my middle reach, which is very a lot varied. I can sing very different styles of mm-hmm. in that reach range and he says my my power belting notes are d d5 e5 f5 nice and he actually he actually told me that that he doesn't know any other singer that can belt as high as i could and i was also surprised by him saying that because i don't think that that is my stronger suit to belt and then I just squeeze out a couple of high notes as if it's nothing. But a lot of it is also what's between your ears. Like certain th- songs which you might have struggled with, but you feel insecure about. But technically, you can e- you can do more difficult stuff. But it's so programmed in you. Like, okay, this is the tricky part. Now I'm going to f-, f it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then there are, there are th- songs that are... Yeah, very complex, and it's like a piece of cake. I just waltz through it because yeah. you don't have that negative association with it. Or, uh, yeah, oh, that high note, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. And then you already have the the wrong um, mindset. Yeah. That is an, a big part. I'm like, um, uh, I do a lot of eyebrow aerobics because it makes me feel that I can get higher. Or like <laughs> like the little, the little um, rope you have on your head. Higher. Like the ballerina, yeah, and that that helps helps me. I think everybody has funny little uh, tricks. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that make them get that note and of course it is pressure the, the right uh, support and uh, squeezing the oranges under your armpits and <laughs> the, those those kind of things to yeah, the tricks. to get it yeah one of the most amusing ones i've ever heard i heard in high school um was uh between your your nether cheeks and clinch clinch a nickel right so squeeze your yeah. butt a little bit for a high note <laughs> yeah that, yeah like that like kind this. of can help sometimes in certain situations it's it might it's always funny but everybody for has me it's things. it's this squeezing squeezing the oranges and the like mm-hmm. putting my feet even deeper in the ground so, <gasps> so to speak yeah. right isn't it strange you don't have breath muscles in your feet Mm -hmm. but thinking about your feet as if they were in the stage or even thinking about that energy coming up from below your feet Mm -hmm. it works (laughs) yeah i think because then you you also you use your Mm -hmm. your rib cage the muscles here and your belly to you really like push it down to make Mm -hmm. your feet go deeper into the ground i guess that's 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 a good way uh, to explain it yeah, I think that's. I'm I'm not very good with the uh, um, anatomy of every little thing in in the throat and the body as well. It's just how I perceive it, I guess, and try to describe it. <laughs> Ultimately, I think that that's one of the things that's most important to hear and learn from, because mm. on one end of the spectrum, I can talk to you about all of the physical happenings the mechanics of what's happening and that actually is very reassuring for some people they like understanding in that way but you can't feel all of those things happening you you Mm -hmm. instead are tapping into different sensations and Mm -hmm. essentially a teacher or a recording will respond back to you that the set of sensations you had during that take were good and then mm-hmm. you just keep doing that set of sensations over and over. We don't have many nerve endings that are down there in our vocal folds and really able to feel everything mm-hmm. that's going on. So instead you rely on maybe a feeling of openness here or a feeling of your support going through your feet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tried in the, in the times where we couldn't tour. I can't say the word pandemic <laughs> one more time. Um, <laughs> I've used up my words, uh, um, but... I did a a vocal class through Skype and for me that just didn't do it. It didn't work. Mm. Uh, It was with a lot of people and my husband was probably laughing because I was, I was making sounds like a squeaking duck (laughs) and I was, I was doing, um, I was trying to apply the techniques that he was trying to teach us. But for me and my experience, I always loved being in the same room with the teacher Mm -hmm. so I've not been like an advocate for online vocal lessons but that's Mm -hmm. just my personal opinion yeah because uh yeah it's 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 tricky I mean but that was the only way I could do it I thought okay it should be fun I want to learn something and uh, so I was belting my guts out at uh, eight in the evening (laughs) in winter time but it I could sense it was not feeling 100% so I Mm. knew I was doing something wrong and having that teacher in the room with you, it's a different way of, of, of exchanging yeah. knowledge and, and seeing also through the webcam. It's, it's, it's just not working for me. I really think that um, sort of having taught before pandemic, taught through pandemic, and mm-hmm. you know, still at this point, well, at this point, I'm on maternity leave and not teaching students for a few months, mm-hmm. which is really good. Because, oh my goodness, scheduling things is a nightmare at the moment. <laughs> but I mm-hmm. think that I, I needed to learn how to teach in a different way online mm-hmm. and provide different resources. Uh, ultimately, when you have a really, really advanced student, especially if they're advanced in opera, in opera we're working off of acoustics in a different way because we don't have any sort of amplification um, so if you are used to working operatically on things, mm-hmm. I don't know that 
online lessons all the time for an advanced operatic student is going to work. At least you have to have some supplement of knowing what that person sounds like in the room so that you are familiar with their voice and can say, okay, I know that online if they're doing this, this is what it sounds like in the room. But Mm -hmm. um, for establishing a base foundation with people that work well online, I think it can be done very well. It just, it required me to shift a couple things in my teaching style in order to Mm -hmm. connect to people the right way. (laughs) Yeah, if you have that, that skill set i mean for for me i taught singing lessons a couple of times it was not my my thing (laughs) and i tried some online workshops and i also i don't know i enjoyed actually being one-on-one with my teacher um being in the same room he was also not not touchy but he would like okay shoulders down (laughs) tilt your hips Uh, Uh i see that the breathing is too high you know and that is something of course now maybe we have better audio we have better video so it's almost like being in the same room but there's another factor with singing for me it's also a very intimate thing I guess Mm -hmm. maybe some people would feel more open to have online lessons because of not having somebody in a room watching you Mm -hmm. um but yeah I think that put that very very well some people are able to do it because of that but then some Mm. people feel that it's missing that because I Mm. voice teachers often it can become just a very a very close relationship um Mm. one of your closest friends really right Mm -hmm. and yes the voice is when you're singing you are just vulnerable it is a part of you uh, the way that the nerves that go through it connect to your emotional center and your brain. Mm, mm. It, it's like you, anything that comes out is you and you can't hide if something terrible has happened in the day. So you better trust the person you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can understand people that can sing on funerals. I've done it (sighs) once, but I was so affected by everybody being sad Mm-hmm. that uh, it was uh, horrible for me and I was asked to sing at the funeral of my grandfather and I declined I told him I, it's going to sound horrible I don't think I can make any anything sound good on that day because I had that big lump in my throat <laughs> and I'm I'm too sensitive for that stuff so I did it once it was um it was an exception and I did it with my husband and he forgot one cable for the keyboard and he unplugged the microwave and was able to use that cable. Otherwise, <gasps> I would have had to sing a cappella in the church um, during a funeral. So that was a last minute stress thing. Mm-hmm. But we are we were very pragmatic and we returned the cable. So oh, it was but, very nice um, return the microwave cable. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can I will never sing on on funerals ah. again. I told that to myself. That is, um, I cannot shield myself for the sadness. Of yeah. all the people in the room. I think one of my worst performances ever was at my grandpa's funeral. So mm-hmm. I feel you there again, again. <laughs> relate. <laughs> Hard to relate. Um, okay. We've talked about like belting and um, opera. And we haven't talked about, I feel like, a very key part of your singing, which is Disney and how great <laughs> you sing part of your world. <laughs> It's such a oh, beautiful, beautiful performance. I love that video that you put out. I want to be where the people are. I want to see, want to see them dancing. Walking around on those, what do you call? Oh, feet. Flipping your fins, you don't get too far. Legs are required for jumping, dancing. Strolling along on the, what's that word again? How do you turn on the Disney vibe? Is there some way that you think about it or you think, do you just say, I'm going to be Ariel right now? I I grew up with watching Disney movies and Disney princesses singing um, A Whole New World, uh, of course, Part of Your World, but in in Dutch. 
and <laughs> I I always I think a lot of I was not a typical girl that I had dolls and everything, but I never liked the color pink. I never rode um, horses or ponies, <laughs> um, but I loved the the Disney, the old Disney movies, and the music yeah. and the singing, and also the, the the voices they picked for them, which are always very you know kind of the same same style. Um, I think the Dutch one, she's called Laura Vlasblom, if I'm correct. She's also a musical singer, and. I just mm-hmm. loved the very soft, slight, naive, uh, childlike teenager voice of you know of, of a female voice, and my voice has a little bit that character, mm-hmm. I guess. And our producer always tells me, "Yeah, you should, uh, if you don't want to be metal anymore, just record a Disney album." Or we even <laughs> talked about that one day, and I was like, "Oh no, copyright! That's going to be tricky. Let's not do that." And then I started working with my husband. We recorded uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, this is oh, Halloween that. song. <laughs> mm-hmm. He produced the whole thing. And then I, I filmed and edited it. It was a lot of fun. Mm. And uh, then I thought, okay, now I'm going to do Ariel. And I recorded it myself at home. And my husband mixed my voice. And then I asked my friend Jens, uh, who's also working uh, with Epica a lot, if he could film a little video and I never knew that it was going to become so popular, I guess. And having the blog and being very open about also the physical presence of being in a band and what it's like. I've been called many times like a a metal princess or metal Barbie, you know? So I thought, why not sing Disney? There are a lot of my female colleagues that have also recorded other Disney covers. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us grew up listening to those songs, singing along to those songs, besides the typical children's song. Um, So Ariel, I always loved that song very much. But there there are more Disney songs that I love also from from Beauty and the Beast. Pocahontas, Colors of the Wind. So gorgeous. Um, That is such a beautiful song. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and that is one of my bucket list things to also do ones for vocals for a movie or a Disney movie, sing those songs. But if I'm honest, I am not a big fan of Let It Go. Oh. <laughs> I, I could I could probably like sing it. I've done it for fun, but mm-hmm. for me I'm not I'm not a Queen Elsa or Anna uh fan, so people will probably not hear me sing that that song. But I love the old Disney. A yeah, lot. that is my my jam. <laughs> it's definitely a new style, I would say, mm. um, or it's sort of a new musical direction. You have like mm. the Alan Menken Disney, and and then you have a, a bunch yes. of new Disney that's a little more pop influenced, I would say. Or it's yes, not even just and, that. Sometimes we're having like different cultures really influence, like um, an Encanto, where you have a little more of the Latin rhythms. I love in. that. That mm-hmm. that that for me. Uh, but I, I couldn't finish the movie because it was too hyper for me. Oh, uh, I I am I have a, this strong connection with the old Disney movies that also the classical music yes. is connected with it, and it has this serene, uh, safe feeling. I love to just let Disney movies run on my phone if I try to take a nap or so because it relaxes me. Mm-hmm. And but I don't like the original Snow White voice. That is so high and squeaky. It's and and the vibrato it <laughs> makes me aggressive. <laughs> but I love the Dutch Ariel um, uh-huh. more than the English version. Oh really? Um, oh, I'm gonna have to look at the difference yeah. between those two now. And also um, Jasmine. Oh, I have to dig up all the Disney knowledge now. Um, I can't watch it with my son because he he likes more the the brutal stuff, like the Incredibles, the you know, oh, superheroes, yeah. Spider Man, of course. And I'm like, can we watch Cinderella? No, no. What about Mulan <laughs> or, though? Uh, I mean, they had the Be a Man. <laughs> I've never seen Mulan. Oh, really? Confessions of uh, yeah. Of- I think at least in the in the U.S. versions, I think it was Lea Salonga that did both Jasmine and Mulan. I think I might be wrong. Internet, don't okay. tell me if I'm wrong. But I think it was the same voice that did that. 
Okay, yeah, I'll have to check it. I, I am more familiar with the Dutch versions of the older Disney mm -hmm. uh, movies. And I also, um, when my son was smaller, I used to sing Once Upon a Dream for him <gasps> uh, to sing him oh. asleep. And I also love the Lana Del Rey version, the dark version. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I love, I love um, yeah, Sleeping Beauty a lot. Uh, the, the songs are beautiful. So I just have this burning question, which is how in the world did you practice when your son was really, really young? I'm, you know, two months into it here and it is so hard. I, I can sing him lullabies and I do that or I'll do lip trills with him, you know, just to make, he, he really likes lip trills right now. He's totally wide eye. Like, what are you doing, mom? That is the strangest, coolest sound. But <laughs> I can't practice opera with him at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's super loud with him mm. right there. Mm. And and either he's usually with me or he's asleep, in which case we don't want to wake him up. Mm. Uh, and if he's with my husband, it's usually because I'm trying to have a work meeting. <laughs> so, yeah, what? that the I actually was in the studio when he was two months old. I recorded my vocals oh. for the Quantum Enigma. Yeah. And How did you do that? How did you even I don't practice know. for that? It was a traumatic experience because <laughs> I, I had the, I had a newborn baby and I wasn't hundred percent no. healed from everything physically and mentally or like not healed but yeah, I was not back to my old self and I mm -hmm. wasn't sleeping so I was exhausted. I, I don't know how I how I did it. And my son was there in the studio with me. So I was breastfeeding oh my gosh. and eating a sandwich at the same time. And then going back in the studio uh, and sing it for a couple hours, feed him again, eat again, sing again, and then go to the hotel and not sleep during the night. And I did that uh, for two weeks. My first, my mother was there. My husband was there for a couple of days. And then my mother was there and... Um, then my husband came again and then he picked up, uh, our son. And that was the first time I was away from him because we could not get to finish the recordings because I was so exhausted. Um, yeah. So that was the reality <laughs> of being, uh, being a mom and in retrospect, I should have planned or I should have, I, I didn't know, you know, we had the we had the schedule of this is how the album's going to be recorded. Mm -hmm. And it was two months after I became a mom and I was actually not ready physically yeah. and mentally to record an album, but I did it in the end. Yeah. I, and it's I very it was strongly crazy. <laughs> feel that, that um, more time, at least for me, I thought I'd be able to get back to work. I thought I was going to be working full time at this point, and now we're keeping me part time till January. Mm -hmm. So that's that. It'll be six months, and mm. I, I made that decision because, oh my gosh, the amount of time and like you mentioned, the sleep and breastfeeding is hard and really mm. time consuming as well. <laughs> so people yes, think about just the child sleeping, but our bodies are doing crazy things. And the mm -hmm. hormones on top of that, uh, just your hormones are going nuts. And then mm -hmm. how do you find time to practice or do normal I things? <laughs> I, I didn't practice much. I, I was breastfeeding while writing the lyrics for the new album oh at the gosh. same time. My husband was on tour. Uh, so I moved in with my parents-in-law so they could help me at least with, with cooking and mm -hmm. Uh, buying food and and taking my son every once in a while and then I started also giving him uh, a bottle of formula in the evening so mm. I could regain my strength a little bit because he was um, like almost one, every one and a half or two hours waking me up and I was oh. like I can't see straight anymore uh, I was it was really really tough so yes. um, I I couldn't practice that much no and uh, I just had to improvise, I guess. <laughs> and I uh, I still had physical pain while singing. 
mm-hmm. the really heavy stuff. I could just, I could still feel that everything was not at its rightful place yet. Yeah. And energy, of course, and hormones. And my aunt, I wrote a song, a lyric as, uh, um, for, for my aunt who died of cancer. She died a couple of days before my son was born. So she never met him. And I, I wrote a song, It's the ballad's called Canvas of Life because she was a painter or she loved to paint. And I wanted to kind of uh, describe the circle of life. You know, I was about to become a mom and I had new life growing inside me and she knew she was going to die. So I met her in the summer so she she saw me fully pregnant, but she was not doing well. Mm-hmm. And then I was, I used one of her paintings in the artwork as well. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write a song about her. And then I was in the studio. So she passed a couple of weeks before Vincent, my son, was born. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't sing the song. I was so emotional because, of course, the hormones. Yeah. But also I, was, I thought, shit, uh, like... It's it's good to be emotionally in, involved in the music, in the lyrics. But there is a point, like with singing at a funeral, where you just choke up. Yep. And I had that problem a lot. And I had to tell Yos, okay, we need to take a break. And I need to think of something happy because uh, it's triggering the, the frog <laughs> in mm-hmm. my throat, the lump in my throat. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, and of course I was emotionally, physically so exhausted and more emotional than, than usual. And I was crying at several occasions because it was just really tough. Yeah. And I was trying to do it all, you know, trying to keep everybody happy, keep my son alive. <laughs> and I was like walking around like a zombie, um, yeah, <laughs> trying to squeeze out that last note. <laughs> that, one more note. Oh, man, that is that just seems like a very tough experience. Um, it was. <laughs> what, you've talked a few times about the physicality and uh, how it sounds like how your support essentially had shifted as you were singing and that you had uh, physical pain still. Um, mm-hmm. Can we talk about how support and the way maybe even thinking about breathing, how that shifted through pregnancy and then after pregnancy for you? I, I performed live until I was six months pregnant. Yeah. And I had a, a huge belly and f- people were saying, oh, respect to you for yeah. performing, uh, like highly pregnant. And I still had three months to go, but I was just huge. I had a huge baby <laughs> inside of me. <laughs> Plus my belly was really going to the front. So it was like, it had to go somewhere. Did you have room to breathe still? Yes. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I could. I had no physical restraint being pregnant. The only Mm -hmm. thing was trying to get my my shoes on and Mm -hmm. and refuse to wear maternity wear. So I just bought dresses, stage dresses, a couple sizes up and squeezed myself into that. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved being pregnant on stage and singing on stage. It was like we had the seventh secret or not so secret band member on stage. And I'd like to tell it to my son, like, you've already been to China. You've been to Australia. I took you with me, you know. I thought that was uh, really a beautiful experience. And But recording my vocals afterwards, I could sense that... Uh, my support system, of course, the, the belly muscles, they go to the side. Yeah. And I have to go back, and I had the, not the official. There's a term for it. I am very bad with Latin names, but when the belly muscles don't go together, and you get a little bit of dome shape. When they belly. split, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I never had that official diagnosis. But I did feel like okay, my suddenly my support system feels weird. Everything is weak, mm-hmm. uh, stretched out. Um, but I had more pain. And the lower parts, so like, like not, the pelvic not necessary. Floor. Yes, yes, because mm-hmm. yeah. I had a natural birth, <laughs> mm-hmm. so that that was uh, that was Ugh. painful for me when I was 
tensing all the muscles. I felt like I was about to give birth again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, those muscles, like you, there's tearing that happens down there too. And it just, that is extremely difficult to come back to that. If, I mean, even if you just do like a hard S and you go, that kind of thing, I think people can you feel it that there. lower connection. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, from my experience, I think because I've been very aware of using those muscles um, since super young and, and continually sort of leaning into the pelvic floor to help with really high, long notes. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In delivery, I felt like that helped me a lot. And I was a really good pusher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like doctor said, oh, wow, okay, you you know how to use those muscles. And I said, yes, thank you very much. I've used those for singing for years. <laughs> um, but coming back to it afterwards, it, they felt tired, which mm -hmm. is... That sounds like that's I, what you experienced. I use the, the hypnobirthing technique, which is oh. also very much based on or basically all courses you can do to prepare for birth is all based in the lower breathing section. Mm -hmm. And I had that advantage being a singer of having already that conscious connection or it's unconsciously already. I don't have to remind myself to do that it's it's in my system so uh -huh. and that helped me a lot with with the birthing uh, of my son and um trusting that your body is made to do that and knowing how you can relax and and keep the adrenaline away so everything just you know i i was the most relaxed i ever was while giving birth Whoa. which was really funny because i'm not <laughs> a relaxed person or my husband makes fun of it. I may appear calm, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm a very restless person. But when I when I was giving birth, I was meditating and I was in this in the zone, and I could do it again tomorrow, I guess. And um, wow. it was definitely a uh, life altering experience and a good one because the thing is, when we also recorded the vo the, the quantum enigma after I gave birth two months after. For me, it felt like a couple of births in a way. I had a son, but I became a mother. And the the album was written while I was pregnant and the lyrics as well. And I recorded it after I gave birth. So I have a very strong connection to that album. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, now I kind of lost my, my train of thoughts. But we were talking about the support system and, and the yeah. muscles and everything. But yeah, in, in Dutch we say, like, if a guy sings, like, you have to get it out of the nuts, you know, that's <laughs> what we do as well. I mean, yeah, I, if I sing, form. I tense all this lower this lower area. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking now, so I'm not using all those muscles. I'm trying to think, like, okay, I'm going to sing now really hard. Which muscles do I activate? It's such an automatic thing now Yes, that it's hard to think like, okay, that's what my body does. It's just, it goes into this mode automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I really love your comment about being so proud of being pregnant while performing. I had a, a sort of a similar feeling that I really wanted to um, be proud of the pregnant body instead of just feeling like, oh my gosh, I look fatter every single day that I'm recording these YouTube videos uh, you know, because a lot of times they're from here up. I thought, I want to show off my belly. I want to show it off. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is this is something, a moment I think that we should take pride in. So I did um, the Ursula, Poor Unfortunate Souls, and but oh, the, cool. <laughs> had my belly be my pregnant belly <laughs> and did a cover. That's cool. It was really fun. <laughs> And I feel like at some point I'm going to get to tell him, oh, look, see, you're famous. You were in that one. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of photos of me with, with the belly on stage. And mm -hmm. I never for once felt fat while being pregnant. And I know this now this trend that Rihanna started that you just have your naked pregnant belly out on display. I think it's cool. I mean, it's a marvelous thing mm -hmm. that the... That, uh, female body is capable of doing and I felt more powerful being being pregnant or I guess more magical in a way <laughs> you're going life <laughs> yeah yeah I was I was singing with with uh like 
two beating hearts in a way. So mm-hmm. there was, and my son was always very calm when I was singing. He, oh yeah, he was more active during the day, but during the shows he was totally uh, calm. Mm-hmm. And um, he has a very strong musical. How do you say? Um, antenna. He's playing piano uh, really well. He started okay. to play guitar, but he feels music very strongly. And uh-huh. if I sing ballads, he wants me to stop because it makes him sad. He's Aww. very strong. Uh, and of course, and there was a time where he didn't like the band because that would mean mommy is not home. And now he's at the t- phase where he's super proud, like, yeah, my mom's famous. And like, Shh, don't tell me I'm not famous. <laughs> I sing in the band. Uh, we sit, we make jokes about us. Like, I sing in a small little orchestra, you know, like orchestra. But uh, he's super proud now and uh, watches videos on on YouTube now. And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, don't watch that. That's, that's weird. I mean, I'm, <laughs> here I'm his mom and not the singer of... Uh, of a band that's traveling around the world, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that he's able to sense the emotion of music. I imagine that was built up while he was in you. He he could he would before he could play piano or sing or we actually practice music with him, his little foot would go with the beat of the music <gasps> and it would change if the beat of the music would change. So he has a good rhythmical sense. Mm-hmm. Plus, he can sing while he's playing piano. He can sing the notes mm-hmm. really well. And he's also singing in the choir. Nice. Um, and he voluntarily wanted to start to play the piano, uh, the, the guitar, the acoustic guitar, classic guitar. Yeah. So <laughs> he already beat me. He can play more chords than me now. <laughs> <laughs> good job. You're supposed, yeah. to, supposed to take the best things and, and continue to move them on right from your parents. Yeah, well, he's lucky that his father is a teacher and he mm-hmm. he can get piano lessons. He gets like five or six times in, in a week. So almost every day he gets a piano lesson. It's oh, crazy, awesome. those little fingers. And he has very um, limber uh-huh. fingers. So or he dexterous. can play. Yeah, dexterous. He can play chords where my husband, as a music teacher, also says not everybody can do that. And he's. I saw it yesterday. He was showing like playing with uh, the cutlery with the knife and then I saw how far he could spread his fingers like that, oh that's not normal is it <laughs> maybe he can play Rachmaninoff one day who knows yeah maybe ha ah, that's really cool ah uh, I I feel like I wish that I'd been able to sing a little bit more while I was pregnant because I had a lot of struggles with acid reflux and from the oh, pregnancy mm. and sort of him pushing against my stomach and mm. I hear you talking about the limber or like the, there are hormones that can make the voice just feel so smooth when you're pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, it it felt smooth in some areas, but my high notes felt kind of fried. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. But if you have the 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 stomach acid coming up, it's making your voice. Yeah. uh, Your chords uh, hoarse or I know the, the... well, this is maybe TMI, but after, you know, you had to puke or you yep. had some uh, acid coming up, and then you, you get the, the grudge voice uh-huh. after that. Uh, so, uh, so my low notes no... were great. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could do... Uh, yeah, I, I had a very low voice after I give birth. So for the recordings, that was really, really great. There was uh-huh. a different... I don't know if it was also the hormones or if it was also the transformation of becoming a mother and discovering a whole new array of emotions mm. that you didn't have before and different kind of love and, and becoming more vulnerable and I guess uh, opening up more into showing those emotions in the singing as well. But I felt that my voice became warmer in a way. Um, I yeah. I was noticing um, from some of your early stuff to some of your later stuff, and I noticed it sounded like there was more warmth in your voice then than uh, when I was listening to Tides of Time. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, oh, I bet, yeah. I bet that that uh, also uh, women's voices as we age, it, they do tend to lower a little bit over time. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you mentioned that. I think that that I was hearing that as well. Yeah, and I don't know if it's it, it's not something that my technique changed, mm-hmm. 
And I, I had I heard the horror stories about lots of women saying after pregnancy I couldn't sing high anymore. My mm. voice became super low and it never came back. But for me my voice only expanded in mm-hmm. both the low and the high. Yeah, um, your highs still sound gorgeous. And thank floating. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, of course. Um I I was just curious with the, like the with the concerts and being pregnant, it was, you, you're very active on stage. And uh, I was, for the very first time, I saw what a wall of death was, or a wall of epica, I think <laughs> is what you call it, in, uh, and consigned to oblivion. Three, two, one, go! Were, you also run around stage a bunch. When you were pregnant, mm-hmm. did that make you feel out of breath more? Did you have to sort of stand in place more? Or, um, I mean, obviously the balance is off as well. Was it more difficult to move <laughs> around? No, I think my butt also grew a little bit. So oh, I was pretty anchored. Knows? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, but I But I was wearing high heels. Uh, I don't recall being out of breath or anything. Mm-hmm. I, I had a really easy pregnancy and sounds like um it. yeah the only thing I had was not singing related it was just the water retention at the end of the pregnancy oh, yeah. I I felt like an elephant because <laughs> uh, it, it was high summer and I'm anyway not a good I can't handle the heat also non-pregnant and uh, so my ankles were this this big and. I was happy I didn't have to squeeze myself into a stage outfit anymore. We canceled one sh- or we rescheduled one show because I felt I was getting too big. Um, and I thought, I thought, no, I don't want to be in a tour bus, uh, almost seven months pregnant. Um, so we rescheduled that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did crazy stuff while being pregnant. We went to China. We went to Australia. So I had long flights. And one one show or one flight was during the night so I didn't even sleep I was five months pregnant back then mm-hmm. I ate weird things in China I could not identify I was what I was eating yeah. <laughs> so uh, in retrospect I was like oh, that was a little uh, rock and roll <laughs> yeah I, I was gonna say <laughs> from also spending some time in China and knowing mm-hmm. how strict pregnant diets are whoa that was gutsy <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it was. But I always have snack attacks, uh, like muesli bars with me, <gasps> granola bars, nice. nuts, and uh, in case of emergency, chocolate as well. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> chocolate always must have chocolate nearby. Yes. Well, you said something that reminded me of some patron questions, and I want to get to some of these patron questions. But we're going to start with Runa's, which is um, first of all, she wants to know when Epica is going to come back to Australia. And then she also wants to know what has been your favorite place to perform. Um, Australia, I love uh, Australia. Too bad it's on the other side of the world. I know <laughs> it's like the longest flights ever, um, <laughs> but it's worth it. I love the people there. I love the the nature, um, the vibe. It feels kind of European to me hmm. in a way. Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the accent of the right. Australian people. Super charming. Um, I. I was there, we were there twice, once when I was pregnant and then another time. Um, So I have fun memories Mm -hmm. about it and we connected it with China. So we didn't have like the Mm. whole long flight. So we are looking for it uh, and we are looking for it and we're looking into options to go back to Australia, hopefully next year. This year is fully booked. Yes. (laughs) And my favorite place to perform... 
I I get the question a lot if I prefer to be in front of thousands of people or a smaller crowd. Mm -hmm. I would pick a smaller crowd because it is more intimate. Yeah. Um, and you have a stronger connection and interaction with the with the audience. And it's all about the energy and, and the vibe in the air. And of course, playing in front of thousands of people can be uh, wonderful as well. But mm -hmm. I love I love the small cozy clubs, <laughs> and preferably oh, theaters or like old theaters. So yeah. I have something. Of course, I look at the audience. But if the building is really beautiful, I that's a plus for me as well. Right, the, like especially in Europe, there's so many charming theaters there. Yes. Right. Yeah. Quirky Uncle Dave wanted to know, you've had to perform with extreme jet lag, migraines, and food poisoning, among other issues. Do you have any mm -hmm. techniques to help focus yourself in these situations before heading out on stage, or do you just hope that the adrenaline will carry you through? I never bet on adrenaline. Um, <laughs> I know that it, that it's basically always there but I'm always extremely focused and in the zone mm. when I have a show um, especially before a show I like to have my moment of calm I listen to music sometimes it's epica songs just to get into the into the mode and refreshen my lyrics yeah <laughs> uh, because we have a lot of songs yeah. by now And I've had it happen that songs I've performed the most, suddenly the lyrics were gone and I was like, what's happening? <laughs> I think I need to keep up. Um, so I listen to Epica songs. I get ready for the show. I drink my tea, water, whatever. I used to drink Red Bull. I stopped doing that when I got pregnant and I haven't <laughs> touched one Red Bull ever since. It's probably good. And <laughs> I, I like to eat a banana. That's the thing that I've been doing because I don't like to have a huge meal before a show. I've yeah. had that a couple of times. That slows you down. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't eat a lot. So I feel not so like a big rock on stage. <laughs> But mm -hmm. if I have a jet lag, oh, I've had that many times. I dropped my, t my phone in the toilet right before I had to go on stage. Oh, no. We were all sleeping in the backstage. That was actually in New Zealand. And then um, I couldn't fall asleep until noon the next day on the day of the show. And then I slept a couple hours and then we had the show. Everybody was, it was so quiet. Half an hour before the show, we were all lying there like dead. And then like, oh, we have to wake up. We have to do the show. And then I went to the toilet, dropped my phone in the toilet. I was like, what happened? Oh, there's my, my phone. I picked it out and got ready for the show. And I was on stage and it felt like a dream. But I guess at that moment, the automat aut automatism, yeah, you go on autopilot, I guess. Yeah. You try to enjoy it, but sometimes you're surviving. <laughs> When you have either food poisoning, I've had that surgery on my leg. I was sitting on the bar stool performing uh, the show. I had high fever, jet lag, um, lost my voice, still tried to get a sound out of it. I've never done a playback show because that's not my thing. I'd rather sound horrible <laughs> cancel the show or point the mic into the audience mm -hmm. wow so i'm very pragmatic <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds like it but in like all of the best ways try to <laughs> That's good ruben wants to know after hearing the snippet from the famous dutch girl band linda Roos and jessica Mm -hmm. If you would form a once-in-a-lifetime Dutch singing girl band, who besides Charlotte would you like to have on board? And Till Lindemann wearing a dress in clogs isn't an option. Uh, I think Anneke van Giersbergen probably. I think uh, she's also one of my best friends among all the other female singers. We know each other for many years. Uh -huh. uh, we've sung together a couple of times with for Arian and yes. we have a good connection. So. I think uh, it would be Simone, Charlotte, and Anneke, the new Linda Rose and Jessica. It was actually an Arian. Um, I, th I think that was, was that the first time. I think that was the second time I heard you. The first time I heard you was singing uh, Sancta Terra, I think, where you brought Floor with you. And then the next time was Arian in The Day That the World uh, Breaks Down, The Day That the World Ends. Mm -hmm. That that one. Yeah. Where you're singing The Counselor. Song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, I love that. 
And you've done a lot of collaborations with Ariane since too. There's um, their most recent album, Transitus. You did a big collaboration with, yes. with Ariane. Yeah, that that was actually out of the Ariane comfort zone, I guess. That was very different compared to <laughs> Web of Lies and Zero One One Zero One One album. <laughs> That's a, um, that was hilarious. Anyhow. I love working with Arian. He's always very uh, well prepared. I basically just have to study the vocal lines and go to the studio and just sing it uh, in one hour and then I'm done. And then we just talk and we have both have the same kind of dirty sense of humor. So <laughs> uh, it's it's always fun uh, spending, spending time with him. And I was a fan of his work before I was singing in a band myself. So being able to work with him was also a dream come true for me. Oh. And it's always always an honor. And I never have to think twice if when he asks me. So I'm like, of course, I haven't heard a note, but I'll do it. <laughs> he's amazing. Yes, he's a, he's a genius. He really is. Yeah. And he's also a genius at finding great singers to work with. Yes, yeah, so he's also a very good talent scout. That's true. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's> impressive. <laughs> So right. everybody always wants to work with him. So he has that, that um, how do you say? Uh, Allure. Uh, yeah, yeah, he does. He's got that, that metal sex appeal. Uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, we had him on uh, for an interview a while back as well. And oh my gosh, it was just so much fun. Yeah, yeah. he's a cool dude. And he's huge. He's two meters. Every time I see him, like, did you grow again or... It's like, uh, he's one of the tallest duchies that I know. <laughs> That's fun. Let's see, GL Schmidt wants to know, Epica's consistency is astonishing. Many bands, especially ones who write on the same scope as Epica, either stagnate or lose focus after a few albums, but you guys just seem to keep evolving your core sound without repeating yourselves. Could you briefly describe Epica's songwriting process and give your opinion on what the secret to Epica's longevity is? Well, a brief answer there. <laughs> do you right? get a minute? <laughs> That's a long uh, how long? How long do you, uh, we still have um, until the next uh, feeding session? <laughs> All right. We have a few minutes left. A few more okay, questions, too. Um, well... I guess the secret ingredient is that everybody uh, is equal in the band. Everybody gets the chance, the opportunity to deliver songs. So there's mm. not one main songwriter. So Great. I, and I think that's also a luxury that we always have a huge amount of songs to choose from. And we do it for the arts. We do it to have fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we we value each other's opinion we respect each other and yeah i think all of us have our strengths and weaknesses and of course there some some days it is a little bit of a struggle you're also with six completely different individuals with their own little quirky char character uh, traits uh -huh. myself included but we are aware of that and uh, we know it's, it's almost like being married to each other in a way Yes. Because it's not it's not just work, it is really living together and in the smaller spaces, going through beautiful things in life and lots of beautiful things in life. So you really are like family in a way. Oh. And yeah, that's that's how we how we do it. But um It's a beautiful yeah. answer. <laughs> okay, I'm done answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> Lori Miller wants to know in your monitors. How do you like yours mixed? Does the mix change per song? And what happens if they malfunction during a show? Oh, I start cursing if they malfunction. But I, <laughs> right. <laughs> I am very uh, used to having my in-ear monitors. That's something I've done since day one. 
also rehearsing with an ear monitor. So I'm used mm. to hearing my voice really dry. I don't have any effect on it. I hear click track. So I know the rhythm of the song because um, the orchestration and the choir, is, everything is timed. So it's mm -hmm. not like we improvise during our shows. We have yeah. to play along with the click track. Um, so my voice, click track, a little bit of bass, a little bit of guitar, keyboard, orchestration, choir, and grunts. So I basically have everything on my ear, but mm -hmm. my voice and the click track and the orchestration and choir is the loudest because I have to time a lot. I have to sing along with the choir a lot. Um, and my, my sound doesn't change much during the show. There's maybe one song where, uh, like Cry for the Moon, the mm -hmm. beginning, I ask our an ear monitor guy to amp up the orchestration so I can pitch nicely with violins. Nice. And then he go and then he pushes it back after the intro is done. Um, but we do like little like okay, click track higher, and then he knows okay, I need to hear my click track guitar down, <laughs> <laughs> Mark down. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I don't need any drums because my mic picks up the drums from this from the stage. And oh yeah, I hate it of if course. we have a sm if we have a small stage, then I hear a lot of drums mm -hmm. and mainly snare, uh, and that is that is sometimes tricky. And sometimes I have to switch off my in ear monitors. Mm -hmm. I got new ones recently that have like little filter systems in them, so you mm. hear a little bit more ambient sound. Uh huh. Um, and, but I'm never really use it because I want to block off uh, out as much sound on the stage as possible. Also the drums, because they are the loudest. Yes. But the problem is they picked up by my microphone. So, so you just always try to tricky. have your, your back sort of picking up some yes. of the sound and yes. Uh, and I like it if we have a stage set up where I'm then in the middle and the drums are here and the guitars are, uh, the keyboards are there, uh -huh. but sometimes the drums are right behind me. Yep. And if we play in a smaller club that is not very, the stage is not deep, I'm very close to the drums and I hear mainly drums. <laughs> I love you, Ari. Don't, I, I love ah. him. I love our drummer. But he is loud. <laughs> it is loud. Yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Bart wants to know, you and the band always seem to have so much fun and energy when performing. What is the secret? Again, apparently you're full of secrets. What is the secret for keeping up that energy after a good 20 years of being in a band? I just let them ask the questions about the longevity of the band, by the way. I had originally <laughs> thought I was going to ask some of that, and I thought, oh, patrons took care of it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the thing that we like to have fun, I guess. <laughs> um, some of us are more goofballs than others. Some are could join the circus. I'm not naming <laughs> any names, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, we're all just having fun. And even if we have a, a bad day or if we had a fight within the band, we are professional, uh, yeah. musicians. So we still, you know, perform, um, and give our best because that's what, that's what we do, I guess. I imagine that also going through life together in the different phases, especially now that more mm -hmm. of you are having kids, there's. Uh, new ways to continue to grow in your relationships together that's that's true yeah i mean our uh, keyboarder was the first and then his second kid was almost the same age as my son and now we have a fourth uh, epic junior so we almost have a new band <laughs> complete there you go oh <laughs> arnold naderpelt said looking back at epica's lyrics they tend to have a lot of unique, non-repeated text in every song. How do you remember so many long couplets of so many different songs? Do you have any special technique to help you memorize them all? I don't really have a, a special technique. I, I, I've spoken with other colleagues of how they try to memorize lyrics. Mm -hmm. And with each new album that comes, it's like, wow, boy, um, how am I going to fit this in? And I don't use a teleprompter. Mm -hmm. um we had one for the the Aryan shows and he didn't tell us until one day before the show because he wanted us to learn all the lyrics oh that was fine but it was a nice a nice thing to have just in case because once you panic on stage you block and it doesn't yeah. come and sometimes you think oh it'll come and then it also doesn't come <laughs> yeah. 
So a new technique that I have been using the last couple of years because I noticed that, okay, I'm starting to sometimes forget lyrics or be stressed out about it, even though I never was before. Um, I write down the lyrics with a pen on paper because Uh my brain uh, will remember it, will process it differently than if I just listen to the song and sing along to the song. Um, And I've spoken to uh, Annika also once because we, when we tour with other singers, we often ask them to join us on stage Mm -hmm. for a song and she was like, well, that's a lot of lyrics in that song, Storm the Sorrow. And I even <laughs> have to agree with her. It's a lot of lyrics. And I also have to freshen up the lyrics every once in a while. And she's like, yeah, what I do is I visualize and see like what you are singing about. And that helps her. And I started implementing that as well. Um, mm-hmm. Trying to literally see in front of you what you're singing about yeah that helps but brain farts come and go can't help it <laughs> right. especially with jet lag when you're tired <laughs> then it's difficult yeah exactly it for me especially when i'm singing in another language the writing helps a lot mm-hmm. a lot a lot a lot um because mm-hmm. if if that language isn't your first language then making sure you know exactly how to spell each of those words and where the divisions are in them and what that mm-hmm. word means, if you're writing it, it really tests that knowledge, I think. So I think that's really good. Yeah, and writing is still different than typing. I also <laughs> often type things, like when we had our huge stream concert, Oh My God Alive, I made a whole script, uh-huh. and I typed down all the songs. I didn't, I have copied it from Google, and then uh, there's often a lot of mistakes in it, and I'm like, that's not the lyric. Now I'm screwed. I don't know what the lyrics are. Huh. Uh, so then I go through all the songs, beginning to end. I'm kind of a fast typer, but sometimes I have to jump back a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And then I type the whole lyrics uh, as I'm listening to the song. But writing it down is is a deeper level of really planting the seed in mm-hmm. your brain, planting the, the lyrics in there. Yes, totally agree. <laughs> And then last question from Erin During, who said, it can be difficult enough to find what feels like a healthy work-life balance with both parents working in careers with fairly regular hours. I can only imagine how complicated it might get when one or both parties are on the road. Um, So I'm curious how you and your husband achieve a satisfying balance between career and family. I guess mutual understanding of both being in the business and respect for each other and being supportive and having a good support system and then family uh, helping us coordinate everything. But it is a very, uh, it is a struggle to organize everything. Um, so we we go with the flow, I guess. And we've had times where it was very a hard being apart a lot or just basically mm. giving each other the key and like okay now I'm gone bye you take the baby <laughs> yeah. that has happened before um but we try to when we plan tours make sure that they are not timed at the same time um longer than a couple of dates but we have it we have it figured out I guess for now and it works really well so we're lucky we're very happy <laughs> that we have people helping us I love them. Just mutual understanding and respect. I feel like that's that's key to all relationships in life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got together before we had a child and we both are in the business and um, we also give each other enough space to do other art projects that are not necessarily profitable because we mm. understand you need that also mm-hmm. uh, in order to be creative and to be inspired again. You need to do other things that are fun but you know not necessarily bring in the big bucks but that is also very important being an artist and we both just work our asses off and we schedule time for the family um as much as we can so oh and speaking of that i heard i heard the wee one just give a little cry (laughs) so I believe somebody really and <laughs> needs needs uh, his his milk. Yeah, we're drinking yeah. our tea and uh, I know he's like it's mm-hmm. my turn. <laughs> yeah, feed me. So Aww. thank you so much for 
taking time and chatting with me. I especially appreciate the insights into motherhood. That's just, it's very heartwarming and encouraging. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great thing. And combining both can be tricky at times, but I consider myself lucky that I have both. So mm -hmm. even though it might be challenging sometimes. Yeah. How can we support you? Where can we find your music? Um, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, maybe Patreon and some ways that we can subscribe to you there. Um, really, let us tell me the ways that subscribers and myself can best support you. <laughs> uh, we have tours coming up really soon. Um, Yay! We have our anniversary <laughs> show. Mm -hmm. which is sold out but mm -hmm. yesterday we announced that it's going to be live streamed so everybody can join everybody can see this super unique concert that will take place on the 3rd of September mm -hmm. um, you can get your information at the Epica website epica.nl um, I have uh, my own Patreon which is basically focused on uh, I call it audiovisual art it's um, cover songs, um, get to know me better, uh, photography related videos. My goal is because I also work as a part-time portrait photographer. I want to create my own, um, coffee table book. And that is a little bit the goal that I set through Patreon, um, in combination with me singing a song every once in a while. And I also have the tea time there, but People can ask me all sorts of questions and live hangouts, and it's been a lot of fun. And it's just my name, Simone Simons. You can find me there on all social media, on Patreon. Um, my photography website is also that name. My blog, Um, Yeah, I'll give you all the information except my PIN code. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. And we will write all of that as well in the About section below this video so people can find those links. And Thank you. <laughs> and really... I encourage everybody to support you. You're just an incredible artist and uh, really, really beautiful singer in person. Thank you so much. Very well, lovely to chat with you. I guess we can uh, chat for hours, but somebody's hungry. Someone's hungry. I also got to bring my almost nine-year-old baby to bed. Aw. <laughs> well, cheers to you. And Cheers. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for having cheers. me. Thank you. Thank you.